Number 16. Maraid Quigley In late 2023, a 19-year-old woman named Maraid Quigley was pulled over in Pullman, Washington for various traffic violations. During her conversation with the cop, she allegedly showed signs of possible intoxication. Quigley was uncooperative with the cop's attempts to perform impairment and field sobriety tests, prompting the officer to arrest her on suspicion of driving under the influence. When she took a breathalyzer at the police station, her blood alcohol content registered at 0.179, more than twice the legal limit for driving. It should have been a standard DUI arrest, nothing exciting by any means, but Quigley went viral for her rude behavior during her interactions with law enforcement. In a body cam video of her conversation with the officer who pulled her over, she did not seem to think that the cop had much of a reason to suspect her of drinking, even though he pointed out that she failed to use her turn signal and nearly struck a curb. She repeatedly asked what would happen if she refused to undergo a field sobriety test, even though the officer clearly explained the first time that he would make a decision on whether or not to arrest her for DUI. After Quigley went viral, news outlets further reported that she was a star water polo player at the high school she had graduated from back in 2021. According to TheBright.com, she led her team to numerous victories and was also credited with various undefeated streaks. Unfortunately, she is now also known for acting like a brat toward the cops when they suspected her of driving drunk. Quigley ultimately owned up to her action and pleaded guilty to the DUI charge. She was sentenced to a day in jail and two years of probation. Her driver's license was suspended for three months and she was also ordered to pay about $70 in court fees. Number 15. Jarek and Jevon Allen Late one night in December 2023, deputies were dispatched to a high school in Montgomery County, Texas, where a basketball coach had been assaulted. The incident took place in the parking lot where the coach suffered injuries to his head, neck, face and arms at the hands of multiple attackers. According to news sources, one of the suspects was identified as Jevon Allen, who was benched earlier that night during a basketball game due to his behavior toward a player on the opposing team. Jevon was allegedly furious about being taken out of the game and returned to the school later on with his equally upset family. The coach told police that the interaction between him and the Allen family began as a verbal confrontation. He accused Jevon and his 22-year-old brother Jarek of escalating the argument into physical blows. Another coach and several witnesses broke up the fight and the suspects fled the scene. Law enforcement tracked the Allen brothers down later on and charged them with assaulting a public servant. They were each released on a $23,000 bond while their case works its way through the court system and the coach is reportedly recovering well. Number 14. Logan Shoemaker on what began as a normal day in September 2017, police in Buffalo, Iowa spotted a 20-year-old wanted man named Logan Shoemaker out on the road and attempted to apprehend him. Shoemaker was wanted on multiple charges but refused to pull over. He led the cops on a harrowing pursuit in his pickup truck, hitting speeds of up to 90 miles per hour as he blew through stop signs and traffic signals. At some point during the pursuit, Shoemaker crashed his vehicle into a garbage truck. He stole the garbage truck and continued to evade police, leading them down a dirt road at dangerously high speeds. As Buffalo Police Chief T.J. Benning prepared to lay stop sticks in the road, Shoemaker rammed into his patrol car. Benning was seriously injured and has undergone more than 15 surgeries to repair the damage to his leg. Shoemaker claimed that he didn't mean to hit Benning's vehicle, but the destruction caused by his behavior was not taken lightly. He was hit with 19 charges, including leaving the scene of an accident, assault while displaying a weapon, second-degree criminal mischief, stalking, theft, eluding serious injury by vehicle, robbery, and attempted murder. A jury found him guilty of attempted murder, and he was sentenced to up to 58 years in prison. According to state records, Shoemaker will remain behind bars until 2042 at the very minimum. His projected release date is in 2058. At the sentencing hearing, Benning forgave the man who caused his life-changing injuries, which almost cut his career short. The judge was less understanding, noting how this wasn't Shoemaker's first time going to prison and that he continued to make poor decisions while on probation. Number 13. Annika Trudell 
In what authorities are describing as a drug deal that went bad, 20-year-old Annika Trudell allegedly killed a drug dealer outside a gas station in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin in February 2024. She later admitted to detectives that she made plans to meet up with the victim, 33-year-old Ashley Kalo, to buy drugs, but that she planned to take the drugs without paying. According to a criminal complaint, a fight broke out between the women in the parking lot with Kalo's young son sitting in her car nearby. Kalo was stabbed during the altercation, but Trudell didn't know that she had died from her injuries until a detective told her during questioning. She broke down in tears and said she didn't mean to kill Kalo. Another suspect, 21-year-old Dawson Miller, allegedly admitted to setting up the drug deal, but denied knowing that Trudell planned on robbing Kalo. Court documents allege that he helped Trudell hide after the stabbing, but that he insisted he was unaware that someone had been killed. Trudell is facing charges of first-degree intentional homicide and conspiracy to commit armed robbery with use of force, while Miller stands accused of felony murder as a party to the crime, conspiracy to commit armed robbery with use of force, and harboring or aiding a felon. If convicted as charged, Trudell will likely spend the rest of her life behind bars, while Miller could face up to 90 years in prison. Number 12. Elijah McKinney and Christian Virgil Early one morning in February 2020, a group of young thieves smashed a rock through a window of a car dealership in Wayland, Massachusetts. They triggered the alarm, but by the time police arrived, they had stolen two Lamborghinis valued at $200,000 each, along with a Chevy Cruze. Officers caught up with the two young men who were riding in a stolen Chevy Cruze, but the suspects in the Lamborghinis were nowhere to be found. A few hours later, one of the Lamborghinis re-rendered a car. It was then re-rendered by the stolen Lambo that was trailing behind it. Police arrived at the scene in time to arrest one of the suspects, 18-year-old Elijah McKinney, and they later caught up with 18-year-old Christian Virgil and another young man who was allegedly involved in the heist. Police also accused the trio of being involved in a host of other crimes, including a stabbing and multiple gas station break-ins throughout the greater Boston region. According to police, the suspect slashed a civilian who confronted them for jumping on cars late at night. Luckily, the victim's injuries were non-life-threatening. During a phone call with local station WCVB shortly after his arrest, McKinney said that he regretted being involved in the car theft. He reportedly claimed that he wasn't at the dealership when the vehicles were stolen and that someone picked him up in one of the luxury cars. But he found trouble again in 2022. He was arrested in Cambridge on suspicion of driving on a suspended license, receiving a stolen motor vehicle and stealing a vehicle. While McKinney remains innocent until proven guilty in the court of law, some people might understandably find it hard to believe that he has been arrested for car theft on multiple occasions and somehow just happened to be a victim of circumstance. His more recent case appears to be ongoing. Number 11. Saul Rodriguez 18-year-old Saul Rodriguez of Grand Rapids, Michigan was already facing charges of carjacking and felony assault when he allegedly engaged in a shootout with police in March 2024. The incident began with two police officers attempting to pull over a vehicle for a routine traffic stop shortly before midnight. As they followed the car into a parking lot, Rodriguez exited from the back seat and fled on foot. The officers noticed that he had a gun and began chasing after him, with one of the officers yelling at him to drop the gun. Instead of complying, the suspect fired several shots at the police, who returned fire. Luckily, no one was injured, but Rodriguez escaped. After identifying him as the suspected shooter, law enforcement arrested him at the home of his girlfriend, who he shares a child with. The girlfriend's mother told Fox 17 that Rodriguez does things that he should not be doing, but most of the time what he needs is love, love and understanding. While the woman was understandably scared by the thought of her granddaughter being raised without a father, it's rare for a court to go easy on someone who's accused of shooting at the police. The outcome of the case remains to be seen. Number 10. David Anderson and Alex Barigny in the first of a series of gruesome discoveries that took place in January 1997, 20-year-old Kimberly Wilson was found strangled to death at a park in Bellevue, Washington. While attempting to inform Wilson's family, detectives found their back door open. They went inside and found the murdered bodies of Kimberly's parents, William Bill Wilson and Rose Wilson, in the master bedroom. 
The couple had been stabbed and bludgeoned to death, along with Kimberly's sister, Rose Wilson, who was found in the hallway. Acting on a tip, investigators turned their focus toward a pair of local high school dropouts named Alex Baranyi and David Anderson. The teens were part of a friend group that Kimberly Wilson was known to associate with, and they frequently talked openly about murder. While the rest of the group initially believed the young men were discussing a fantasy, it now appeared as though Baranyi and Anderson were serious about committing the act all along. Baranyi enthusiastically gave police a detailed confession of the murders. When asked about his motive, he said he had been in a rut. He described killing the Wilson family in a disturbingly excited tone, making it seem clear that he had killed for the sheer thrill of it. Investigators knew Baranyi must have had help committing the murders, but he refused to implicate Anderson, who was linked to the crime through forensic evidence. Anderson was also connected to the murders through his diary, which expressed a hatred toward Kimberly Wilson because she had stopped giving him free cigarettes whenever they saw each other. Kimberly was the main target, and her family was killed in case they knew who she was with that night. It's also been speculated that the young men were driven by things like childhood bullying and strained family relationships. They were tried separately and presented very different stories in court. Baranyi argued that he had a diminished responsibility due to mental illness and because the murders were Anderson's idea. He was convicted of four counts of murder and sentenced to four life terms. In the first of two trials, which ended in a hung jury, Anderson insisted that Baranyi acted alone. During his second trial, while he admitted that there were two murderers but denied being one of them. He was found guilty and initially sentenced to four life terms, but was resentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 33 years due to a new state law requiring reviews of certain cases involving young offenders. Anderson will be around 50 years old when he becomes eligible for parole. Baranyi walked out of his sentencing hearing smiling and failed to express any remorse for the murders until years later, while Anderson maintains his innocence to this day. Number 9. Joshua Swartout Police in Atwood, Kansas were baffled in April 2021 when a 23-year-old suspect named Joshua Swartout managed to steal a state highway patrol vehicle while handcuffed behind his back. He drove the vehicle more than 30 miles while hitting speeds as high as 100 miles per hour along the way. Swartout had just been arrested on suspicion of car theft and was being driven to jail when he saw the perfect opportunity to escape. The officer driving the vehicle pulled over to help with a serious motorcycle accident, and since Joshua was riding in the passenger side, with no partition or rear seat cage separating him from the driver's seat. While the officer was preoccupied helping the crash victim, Swartout slid behind the wheel and took off. A high-speed chase ensued, but the car eventually started running out of gas, so Swartout pulled over and continued the pursuit on foot. Police quickly caught up with him and apprehended him, but they didn't ask how he managed to drive with his hands already cuffed behind his back. Kansas Highway Patrol spokesperson Trooper Todd Heilman told ABC News that he assumed Swartout drove using his knees, which is admittedly impressive, especially considering how he traveled through narrow stretches of highway with a ditch on each side. Number 8. Austin Harof the father of 19-year-old Austin Harauf had no idea what was going on inside his son's mind when he suddenly walked away during dinner at a restaurant in Florida in 2016. Austin proceeded to walk more than three miles, stripping down to his underwear along the way before entering a stranger's garage in Tequesta. He proceeded to attack the homeowners, 59-year-old John Stevens III and 53-year-old Michelle Mishkin, with a pocket knife and objects found inside the garage. The couple's neighbor rushed over and was also also attacked while trying to intervene. Sadly, it was too late to save Stevens and Mishkin. Police arrived to find Haruf trying to bite chunks out of Stevens' face and abdomen while on top of the victim and holding him in a bear hug. A deputy tased Haruf, but it failed to subdue him. Martin County Sheriff William Cinder later told People magazine that it took two deputies using every bit of strength they had to get the suspect under control. Investigators struggled to come up with a motive for the seemingly random act of violence. They assumed Haruf was on drugs and were surprised when he tested clean. Haruf's parents said that their son had been acting strangely in the weeks leading up to the attack, and there was a family history of schizophrenia, indicating that the teen's mental health may have been a factor in his behavior. 
Harouf tearfully apologized in a Dr. Phil interview but offered no meaningful insight into why he attacked the victims. He claimed to have no recollection of what happened and denied using any drugs that are known to cause aggressive outbursts like flaca and bath salts. The young man's social media activity offered a different perspective, however. Harouf openly discussed steroid use in YouTube videos just days before the attack, and he wrote in the biography section of his channel, I've got a psycho side and a normal side. He apparently wasn't kidding, as the tragic deaths of Stevens and Mishkin proved. In November 2022, a judge accepted Harouf's plea of not guilty due to insanity. Experts appointed by both the state and the defense testified that he was suffering an acute psychotic episode at the time of the killings, which rendered him incapable of distinguishing between right and wrong. Harouf will serve no prison time for the two counts of first-degree murder that he was accused of and will remain hospitalized at a psychiatric institution until experts determine that he's no longer a danger to himself or others. The outcome came as a major disappointment to the victim's loved ones, including Michelle's sister, Cindy Mishkon, who pointed out that dozens of Harouf's text messages from the months leading up to the attack discussed what seemed like daily drug use and frequently getting blackout drunk. She also accused Harouf of playing the victim and making disparaging remarks about Stevens and Mishkon in jailhouse phone calls with his family. Cindy concluded her impact statement by describing the insanity ruling as white rich boy justice, making it clear that not everyone supported the judge's decision, even if the prosecution and defense had come to a rare agreement about a defendant's fate. Number 7. Joshua Maxwell and Tessie McFarland To make ends meet as a single mom, 20-year-old Tessie McFarland took a job as an exotic dancer. In 2000, she began dating 22-year-old Joshua Maxwell, who had just gotten out of prison after serving three years for an armed robbery. It wasn't long before she signed custody of her young son over to Maxwell's mother and shifted her focus entirely on her new boyfriend. The couple persuaded a landlord in Speedway, Indiana, to let them stay at his rental house in exchange for their agreement to help clean up the property ahead of renovations. But they didn't do the work as promised, and the landlord evicted them from the property. On the same morning that Maxwell and McFarland were ordered to be moved out, the charred remains of 45-year-old airplane mechanic Robbie Bott were found in his burning car not far from the rental home. He had been fatally shot and then set on fire. While doing a walkthrough of the property, the landlord found Bott's wallet wedged between the couch cushions. He called the police and the young couple instantly became suspects in Robbie's death, but by then, they had skipped town. Surveillance footage showed that Maxwell and McFarland had forced Robbie to go shopping and maxed out his credit cards. In one chilling security video clip, Robbie could be seen mouthing the words, help me, while his captors were distracted by the merchandise they were forcing him to buy. Sadly, nobody saw it in time to come to his aid. From there, the couple fled to San Antonio, Texas. By the time they got there, they were almost out of money and needed more as soon as possible. They lured in their next victim, Rudy Lopez, through a personal ad in which they described themselves as an open-minded couple. Lopez didn't tell Maxwell and McFarland that he was a local police sergeant, but it probably wouldn't have changed his fate, even if he had. As you may have already guessed, Lopez was soon found murdered and dumped like garbage in a field. Investigators traced the crime to Maxwell and McFarland, and a national manhunt ensued. Police caught up with the modern-day Bonnie and Clyde pair a week later in San Francisco, where a cop saw them running a red light in Lopez's stolen pickup truck. A brief gunfight ensued, during which McFarland was shot but survived, and both suspects were ultimately taken into custody. They were extradited back to Texas, where they faced the harshest potential consequences for their crimes. Maxwell was convicted of capital murder and spent eight years on death row before being executed in 2010. Before he was put to death, he apologized repeatedly for his actions. McFarland was potentially facing life without parole for murder, but took a plea deal and was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole starting in 2040. Number 6. Brian Sorby and Adam Kreiner in November 2021, police in Lapeer, Michigan received a call about a reckless driver in a Chevy Malibu who was speeding and ignoring traffic lights. The vehicle reached speeds of 120 miles per hour during the ensuing chase. Toward the end of the half-hour long pursuit, the driver, 20-year-old Brian Sorby, tore through a cornfield and then went briefly back onto the road. Then he crashed the car into a drainage ditch. A panicked Sorby got out of the car and ran into a pond. Thankfully, deputies eventually managed to 
to talk the young man into cooperating with them. Sorby's passenger, 18-year-old Adam Kreiner, had started to run away but was more compliant than his friends and quickly caved to the officer's commands. Both men were taken to jail where it was discovered that alcohol played a role in their behavior. Kreiner soon learned that it paid off to be cooperative with the police. He faces fewer charges than Sorby, who will soon answer in court for allegedly fleeing, assaulting and resisting a police officer, and operating while intoxicated. His $10,000 bond was also set much higher than his more compliant friend, whose bond was set at $1,000. All things considered, both men are tremendously lucky that they weren't seriously injured driving at such high speeds and barreling through intersections during red lights. And as Sorby learned, the longer you drag a chase out, the more serious your charges are likely to become. Number 5. Camaro Theft Crew after the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2010, car theft skyrocketed in the United States. This period not only saw an increase in the volume of stolen cars, but the establishment of sophisticated criminal organizations centered specifically around stealing vehicles. One of the most memorable among these groups made news headlines in May of 2022, when a crew of thieves stole seven Chevy Camaros from a General Motors factory in Lansing, Michigan during a brazen heist that was carried out during the early morning hours. The press published frenzied reports stating that the cars were snatched right under the company's nose, but the authorities were more or less waiting for something like this to happen. In the two years leading up to the Camaro theft, cars were apparently being stolen left and right from the plant. They just weren't disappearing in such large batches. As they fled the crime scene, the thieves broke up into two or more groups, with each group consisting of two or more cars. Before they even made it out of Lansing, they were being chased by state troopers, and multiple agencies, including those with drones and helicopters, joined the pursuit as the cars zoomed along the interstate at speeds of more than 100 miles per hour. One group of the stolen Camaros crashed, while another split up in their ongoing effort to evade law enforcement. Quick-thinking members of law enforcement disabled at least one Camaro using road spikes, and five of the vehicles were ultimately recovered. Nine suspects between the ages of 20 and 24 were arrested on various charges, including fleeing and eluding, receiving and concealing a stolen vehicle, resisting and obstructing police, and conspiracy to commit an illegal act. Shortly after being taken into custody, all nine of the accused thieves were released from custody pending further investigation. Authorities declined to go into detail about the decision or the nature of the ongoing probe. Regardless, the botched robbery should have served as a cautionary tale to anyone who might be tempted to try stealing a car from the plant. But it failed to stop two 19-year-old men from Detroit who were caught driving stolen Camaros just a few months after the seven-car heist. One of the suspects crashed the car he was driving into a concrete barrier while the other collided with a fence. They both attempted to flee on foot but were quickly captured and charged accordingly. Number 4. Anthony Woodrow What began as a disagreement over text message between two close friends in South Salt Lake, Utah, ended in the senseless death of a young man in early 2024. 18-year-old Anthony Woodrow was allegedly drunk and stoned when the altercation began over the phone. Woodrow's friend eventually showed up at his home, at which point he and his father, who was also drunk, armed themselves with guns. His mother went outside to talk with the friend, and it seemed like things were cooling off, so Woodrow's father suggested putting their guns away before the mother invited him inside. But Woodrow was not interested in speaking with his friend, so he went into his bedroom. Instead of staying there, however, he came out and got into a fistfight with his friend while his parents tried to separate them. As the friend made his way toward the front door, Woodrow allegedly announced his intentions to shoot him. The victim rushed at Woodrow, who fired five or six shots at his friend and then dialed 911 and reported his actions. Woodrow's friend died from his injuries, and the accused shooter is now facing a murder charge. He claimed that he thought his friend was going to assault him, but the story didn't fly with police, and the case is now in the hands of the court system. In addition to first-degree murder, Woodrow stands accused of four counts of aggravated assault and several gun charges. Number 3. Skylar DeLeon and Jennifer Henderson after being raised by a father who sold drugs and a mother who was addicted to them, John Julius Jacobson Jr. joined the U.S. Navy hoping to gain better footing than the examples that had been shown to him at home. 
but he proved that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree when he went AWOL and ran off to Mexico, where he started going by the name Skylar de Leon in hopes that the military wouldn't find him and punish him for ditching his duties. De Leon was dishonorably discharged from the Navy. In 2002, he married Jennifer Henderson and they had two children together. The couple lived in Henderson's parents' garage, which had been converted into a living space. But it was a little too cramped for the young family's comfort, especially given De Leon's penchant for living wildly outside his means and his desire for the finer things in life. To make up for their lack of honestly earned money, De Leon and Henderson started committing crimes. At first, they robbed small businesses. In 2004, they escalated their actions to something much worse. Somehow, the couple decided it would be a good idea to steal someone's yacht. While perusing ads for used vessels on the internet, they found a boat called the Well Deserved at an asking price of $500,000. It was being sold by a couple named Tom and Jackie Hawks, who were retiring early and hanging up their sea hats in order to move to Arizona and spend more time with family. At around the same time De Leon and Henderson supposedly bought the Hawks yacht, Tom and Jackie mysteriously vanished. When questioned by the couple's concerned relatives, De Leon claimed that he and Henderson had bought the yacht fair and square. It was the same story he would later give to the police. He also told Tom and Jackie's relatives that the couple had moved to Mexico and that he knew nothing of their current whereabouts. Law enforcement eventually got involved and De Leon presented all the proper paperwork for having purchased the boat. When investigators asked for proof of the transaction, he claimed he bought the vessel with cash using proceeds from his previous profession as a drug dealer. Hey, it was better than admitting to what had really happened. De Leon's admission to using ill-gotten funds to buy the yacht was enough for law enforcement to keep him in custody, but he wasn't talking, and neither was Jennifer. The police finally got someone to crack when they interviewed the notary who signed off on the sale paperwork. She admitted that she wasn't actually there when the documents were supposedly signed, and in early 2005, an accomplice confessed to being present when the Hawkses were forced at gunpoint to sign the sale documents. According to De Leon's cooperating co-conspirators, the culprits traveled nearly 20 miles from the California coast before turning on Tom and Jackie. They proceeded to bind the couple, tied them to an anchor, and dumped them into the water while they were still alive. The Hawkses died in one of the worst imaginable ways, fully conscious and knowing they were about to drown as the anchor pulled them 2,000 feet below the water's surface. The more detectives learned, the more horrific the details of the double murder became. One accomplice broke down in tears and said that Jackie had cried and begged to see her grandchild one last time before she died. It was also revealed that even in his most helpless moment, Tom could be seen caressing Jackie's hand in a desperate bid to comfort her during their final moments alive. De Leon maintained his innocence and took his case to trial, which proved to be the proverbial nail in the coffin for his fate. He was found guilty and sentenced to death, which was later commuted to life without parole. During a later interview with 2020, De Leon, who now lives as a woman, said that she committed the crime in an attempt to come up with the money for gender reassignment surgery. Henderson was also convicted of murder and is serving life without parole. Number 2. Alexander Elvira Martinez when it comes to evading law enforcement, there's no denying that suspects can get both creative and crazy. This was certainly the case for a 24-year-old Utah man named Alexander Elvira Martinez, who was arrested at a gas station one evening in June of 2023. Martinez was wanted on an outstanding warrant, and he allegedly had drug paraphernalia in his vehicle. As he sat handcuffed in the back seat of a police cruiser while waiting for the arresting trooper to fill out some paperwork, he got a crazy idea. The car had no prisoner cage to prevent him from working his way into the front seat. The trooper wasn't in the car, and Martinez's handcuffs were loose enough for him to slip one hand free. By the time the trooper realized what was going on, the vehicle was speeding away from the scene. According to police, Martinez blew through multiple stop signs before ditching the vehicle and taking off on foot toward a nearby river. A helicopter was called in to aid in the manhunt for Martinez, who was found at a homeless camp nearly two hours after he was first pulled over. An affidavit stated that he had a syringe filled with heroin in his possession at the time of his capture. 
During questioning, Martinez reportedly said that he stole the car because he didn't want to go to jail and experience heroin withdrawal. But that's exactly where most people go when they steal a police vehicle, and Martinez was no exception. He was booked on felony charges of receipt or transfer of a stolen vehicle, failure to stop at the command of police, possession of a dangerous weapon by a restricted person, and escape from official custody. Martinez also faces various lower-level drug and traffic charges. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. Number one, Serimanta Kong. In a shocking crime that could perhaps be best described as both bizarre and brazen, a University of Connecticut student was accused of faking an injury in order to carjack an unsuspecting woman. He then stole a police cruiser and led law enforcement on a high-speed pursuit. The ordeal began on a scorching summer day in 2016, when 43-year-old Aida Lekic spotted a man lying in the road with an empty water bottle next to him in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey. Lekic initially assumed that the man might have fallen victim to heat sickness while jogging and pulled over to help him while he turned his head and appeared to vomit on the pavement. As she approached to help the man, who was later identified by authorities as 22-year-old Serimanta Kong, he sprang up and made a dash for Aida's Mercedes-Benz while her teenage kids were in the car. Terrified that the children were about to be kidnapped, Aida ran after Kong and began shouting that her kids were in the vehicle. One of her children managed to escape on their own while the frantic mother pulled the other child out of the car. Kong sped off in the vehicle and led police on a chase through several towns. After backing the stolen Mercedes into a patrol car in the town of Alpine, Kong was confronted by officers. He allegedly managed to not only fight them off, but to get into a police cruiser and drive off. The pursuit continued for another 11 miles before an officer disabled the stolen squad car in the town of Paramus by ramming into it. Kong allegedly tried to steal an apprehending officer's gun and bit another cop's leg. Altogether, seven police cars were damaged and several officers sustained minor injuries. The suspect was indicted on 17 charges, including eluding, carjacking, and assaulting a police officer. He was also sued by the victim in civil court. Unfortunately, the outcome of the case is unclear. 13. Anton Lazaro and Gisela Castro Medina After connecting on a sugar daddy dating website in May of 2020, 32-year-old Anton Lazaro and 19-year-old college Gisela Castro Medina conspired to traffic female victims for commercial acts of intimacy. Lazaro paid Medina upwards of $50,000 over a seven-month period to recruit targets who matched his taste in appearances. At the time, Lazaro was a well-connected donor and political strategist for the Minnesota Republican Party. He was also known for flaunting his lavish lifestyle on social media, where he posted photos of himself on exotic vacations, private planes, and hobnobbing with high-ranking politicians. Lazaro allegedly used his money and powerful position to coerce his victims into silence, including by having them sign non-disclosure agreements. But he still caught the attention of authorities, and his days of living the high life are over for now. In 2021, the FBI raided his apartment, to prevent Medina from talking, Lazaro continued giving her thousands of dollars and paying her rent and college tuition. He was nevertheless arrested on multiple federal human trafficking-related counts. During his trial, Lazaro admitted to having relations with the victims but denied recruiting them. He claimed that the case against him was politically motivated, but the jury apparently disagreed and found him guilty on seven counts. Lazaro faces a 10-year mandatory minimum, but prosecutors are calling for a 30-year sentence, followed by 10 years of post-release supervision. He'll be sentenced in August of 2023. Medina pleaded guilty to her role in the operation and is also awaiting sentencing. 12. Jeffrey Pine 51-year-old Ruth Pine was bludgeoned and stabbed to death inside the garage of her Highland Township, Michigan home on May 27, 2011. And the person responsible for her demise was none other than 21-year-old Jeffrey Pine, her own son. Jeffrey was a former star athlete and high school valedictorian who was pursuing a biology degree at the University of Michigan. His arrest for first-degree murder came as a shock to the community, who held the young man in high regard. 
and many people initially refused to believe that Jeffrey was capable of killing his own mother. According to prosecutors, the young man was propelled by pent-up rage over Ruth's mental health issues. Over the years, he'd suffered at the hands of his mother's abuse, and in 2010, the year before Ruth's murder, she even spent time in jail for assaulting Jeffrey. She managed to avoid charges, though, by accepting treatment and promising to stay on her medication following her release. During the trial, Jeffrey's ex-girlfriend testified that Ruth Pine was dangerous when she was off her meds and that she often assaulted her son. Ruth's sister, on the other hand, argued that the victim wasn't the monster the court made her out to be. Regardless of Ruth's mental state, Jeffrey's defense attorneys denied any responsibility whatsoever on their client's behalf, arguing that Ruth was killed by strangers and that her son had nothing to do with it. There was no physical evidence linking Jeffrey to the murder, and the case was largely circumstantial. But despite this, the jury voted to convict Jeffrey Pine of the lesser charge of second-degree murder. It came as a shock to those who supported the young man's innocence, including his father, Bernie, who'd stood by his son throughout the entirety of the case. And after unsuccessfully appealing his conviction, Jeffrey is now serving a 20 to 60 year sentence with an earliest possible release date of 2031. 11. William Shrubsall Almost every teenager on the planet grows annoyed with their parents at some point for being overly protective. But one young man from Niagara Falls, New York, named William Chandler Shrubsall, took his frustrations to the extreme in 1988 when he beat his mother to death on the morning of his high school graduation. Shrubsall had always been an excellent student, so it was no surprise when he was named valedictorian of his senior class at LaSalle High School. He planned to major in pre-law at the University of Chicago later that year, but his inability to control his temper would soon change the entire course of his future. During the pre-dawn hours of what was supposed to be his graduation day, Shrubsall got into a heated disagreement with his 56-year-old mother Marianne after returning home from his girlfriend's house. William's girlfriend lived just two blocks away, but Marianne was upset about how late her son had stayed out. She called the girlfriend's home and demanded that William return, and when the teen arrived home, he was greeted by his mother, who was waiting for him in the driveway. But instead of going to bed and dealing with the disagreement after resting and cooling off, William and Marianne argued, and when Marianne threatened to call his girlfriend's parents and picked up the phone, William tried to stop her. The fight became physically violent, and at some point the young man could no longer contain his rage. Just 12 hours before he was scheduled to give his valedictorian speech, William bludgeoned Marianne to death with a baseball bat. He never made it to his graduation ceremony because he was already in custody on suspicion of murder. The ceremony continued as planned, but Shrubsall wasn't there to give his valedictorian speech. There was also no mention of what had happened or why he was absent. Of course, people knew about the unspeakable tragedy, but they didn't want to think about it. Meanwhile, William told detectives that his mother had hit him first during their final argument. His defense attorney, Paul Cleary, said that while William and Marianne's surface looked good on the surface, it was a different story behind closed doors. Paul Cleary even claimed that Marianne had a history of beating her son and that she constantly pressured William to do better and more even after he became the top-ranking student at his school. Friends and classmates were in disbelief over the horrific crime. In addition to being highly intelligent, William was handsome and well-liked, and overnight he went from having a promising future to facing prison time. Speaking with the Associated Press, several of William's acquaintances described him as extremely nice and mild-mannered. Nobody had ever seen him get angry, and it was impossible for anyone to imagine him losing his temper, let alone killing his own mother. But Shrumsall was perfectly capable of murder, according to a court-appointed psychiatrist, who diagnosed him as a psychopath and a compulsive liar with no hope for a cure. Shrumsall was initially charged with second-degree murder, but he ultimately pleaded guilty to manslaughter as part of a plea deal. He convinced the court to grant him youthful offender status and only ended up serving 16 months behind bars. Over a three-year period starting in 1995, he brutally assaulted multiple women. And while on trial for one of these crimes in 1996, 
Shrubso faked his own death and fled to Canada, where he continued committing horrifyingly violent crimes. American investigators suspected that he was alive and had gone on the run, but they couldn't find him. He lived under various aliases in Halifax, Nova Scotia, until authorities discovered his real identity and that he was the man responsible for terrorizing an unknown number of local women. Then, in 2000, a Canadian court sentenced Shrubsall to life in prison for his crimes. He was paroled in 2018 on the condition that he would return to the United States. And he's currently serving a 9-15 to 15 year sentence in New York State for crimes he committed before he fled to Canada. The state parole board denied his bid for freedom in 2022, and the next parole hearing is scheduled for 2024. With any luck, he'll spend the rest of his life behind bars. 10. Mundil Mayhill In what the media described as a honey trap murder, a 19-year-old straight-A medical student named Mundil Mahill lured 21-year-old Gagandip Sain to her apartment in Brighton, England in early 2011. Sain was brutally beaten by two men and was then set on fire in the trunk of Mayhill's car. Her remains were found in the burned-out Mercedes-Benz 60 miles from the murder scene in southeast London. Authorities charged Mayhill and her two accomplices, Harinder Sain Shoka and Darren Peters, in connection with the crime. Meho and Gagandip were once close friends. But that changed when Gagandip allegedly tried to assault Meho while spending the night in her apartment during the summer of 2010. Prosecutors accused Meho of having Gagandip killed as revenge for the incident. For a long time, Meho admitted to luring the victim over to her home under false pretenses and that she initially failed to tell the police the full truth. She even acknowledged that Gagandip would most likely still be alive if she hadn't gone over to her apartment that night. But she insisted that she didn't know about any plan to kill or even hurt the woman. The jury acquitted Mayhill of murder, but convicted her of great bodily harm. So, instead of focusing on her next academic achievement and the aid work she hoped to do as part of her medical training, she was headed to prison. Mayhill was sentenced to six years and was released in 2016 after serving four years. Harinder Sain Shoka was convicted of murder and sentenced to life with a minimum of 22 years, while Darren Peters received a 12-year prison sentence for manslaughter. Following her release, Mayhill married up-and-coming politician Varinder Sain Bowler, who became the mayor-elect for London's Red Bridge Borough in 2019. Sign Bowler's victory was controversial due to his wife's criminal background and the particularly heinous nature of Gagandip Sign's murder. At first, he publicly defended Mayhill, arguing that she was a great example of a success story coming out of Britain's criminal justice system. Sign Bowler said that he and Mayhill had consciously chosen to keep their side of the story to themselves, and he praised his wife's charity work and other accomplishments from both before and after her legal troubles. Gagandip Sain's family accused Mayhill of trying to sneak out from underneath her actions and weasel her way into polite society after receiving what they considered to be a slap on the wrist from the court. And although Sain Bola initially seemed determined to serve as mayor, despite any public backlash he received, he ultimately withdrew from the position before he was even slated to take over the role from the previous leader. In a statement, he said he didn't want to bring undue harm to the distinguished position by allowing it to be steeped in controversy. He emphasized his continued support for his wife and his desire to shield his family from public speculation and hearsay. 9. Jack Snyder While driving home from his girlfriend's birthday party in the middle of the night in February 2023, a high school senior named Jack Snyder saw two teens walking along the streets of Battle Creek, Michigan in the freezing cold. Knowing that the wind, snow, rain, and frigid temperatures could legitimately endanger their lives, he pulled over and offered them a ride. It wasn't unlike Snyder to help someone in need. He was an honors student at a local high school who was known for his intelligence, kindness, and his moral compass, which pushed him in the direction of doing what he believed was the right thing. Unfortunately, he was unaware that the passengers he picked up had plans to repay his generosity with a horrifying act of violence. At some point during the ride, the suspects attempted to carjack Snyder. 
and they fired two bullets into him before fleeing the scene as officers responded to reports of gunshots. Police arrived to find Snyder lying motionless on the ground next to his vehicle, and unfortunately, he was pronounced dead at the scene. Authorities caught up with the two suspects after receiving an influx of tips from community members, along with surveillance footage that enabled them to track the perpetrator's movements after the shooting. One suspect faces charges of felony murder, carjacking, and two gun counts. According to police, he admitted to stealing his mother's 9mm handgun and firing the fatal shots. He told detectives that the other suspect was chatting on social media with someone he'd stolen cars for in the past. The suspect allegedly said he decided to pull the trigger when it appeared as though Snyder was reaching for a gun or something to defend himself with. The other suspect was hit with one count each of open murder and carjacking. But at the moment, both cases are ongoing. 8. Marin Catherine Vesley In June 2014, police in West Lynn, Oregon, published photos of a large amount of drugs and cash that were seized during a recent traffic stop. The contraband consisted of a pound and a half of psilocybin mushrooms, commonly known as magic mushrooms, as well as 67 methamphetamine and ecstasy pills. Additionally, $1,600 in alleged drug trafficking proceeds was recovered from the vehicle. Behind the wheel was a young woman named Marin Catherine Vesley. Some of the drugs that were seized during the traffic stop were found in the 18-year-old's purse. Vesley and a man who was in the car with her, Gordon Philemukady, were arrested in connection with the drugs. Up until that point, Vesley was a model citizen and a straight-A student, according to her mother, who told Oregon Live that her daughter had graduated early. In high school, she took advanced music classes and calculus, and she had a large amount of volunteer community service under her belt. During one of Vesley's court hearings, her mother told the judge that the young woman had gotten into drug treatment, attended school in New York, and had landed herself a job since her arrest. Vesley took a deal and pleaded guilty to one felony count of attempted delivery of meth in exchange for getting several other felony charges dropped. And in the end, she was sentenced to three years of probation. The judge appointed to her case even commended her for doing all the right things to get her life back on track. According to Vesley's mother, Marin met George Cady after leaving her family home and moving to the Portland area on her own. But trouble soon followed. Cady, who was considerably older than Vesley, opted to go to trial. Unfortunately, though, the outcome of his case is unclear. 7. Joel Ortiz after graduating as the valedictorian of his high school in 2016, Joel Ortiz went on to study information technology at the University of Massachusetts. Known for his impressive tech skills, he was already a seasoned programmer by the time he entered college. During high school, Ortiz was extremely interested in robotics, and he enjoyed passing on his knowledge to other students. His ambitions took a less respectable turn at university, though, when he began stealing cryptocurrency. Using a method called SIM swapping, he stole his victims' identities and convinced their cell phone providers to assign their numbers to him. From there, he took over their social media and financial accounts. In some cases, he even managed to obtain identity documents in his victims' names. Ortiz also sometimes impersonated his victims for the sake of trying to get people to send him money. Investigators reportedly identified at least 40 victims, and it's possible that there were even more that they didn't know about. Around half of them lived in California, and Ortiz allegedly targeted wealthy tech entrepreneurs and cryptocurrency executives. After discovering in 2018 that he was planning to travel out of the country, authorities made their move and arrested him. According to an affidavit, Ortiz admitted to spending around $150,000 in Las Vegas in the weeks leading up to his arrest. Police seized $250,000 in stolen cryptocurrency, although the actual amount he stole was somewhere between five and seven and a half million dollars. Ortiz was originally charged with 41 crimes, and in early 2019, he pleaded no contest to eight counts of identity theft and several computer crimes. As a result, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. In a historic first that would set the precedent for future cases, 
Ortiz was the first defendant to ever be convicted of a sim-swapping scheme at a time when the practice was growing in popularity. A handful of other alleged sim swappers were facing charges for large-scale identity and cryptocurrency theft at the time of his conviction. But authorities hope the outcome of Ortiz's case will influence future rulings. 6. Haley Dakeman As a straight-A student, 18-year-old Haley Dakeman had a lot of options for her future. And as her high school graduation approached in 2021, she made plans to attend the University of New Orleans in the fall. But her life took a tragic turn just days before she was sent to walk across the stage when she and a friend were found unresponsive and rushed to the hospital. They'd each taken half of what they believed was a Percocet pill, but it was actually fentanyl, and while the friend survived, Haley died from the effects of the overdose after spending four days in the hospital fighting for her life. Haley didn't have a major history of risky or rebellious behavior. In fact, she was well-liked among her peers and teachers, and she typically stayed out of trouble. The teen's untimely death served as a sobering reminder that just one bad decision can cost someone their life. In the days following Haley's death, Jefferson Parish coroner Gary Sitanovich said that he hoped the tragedy would be a wake-up call to young people about the dangers of counterfeit pills. Speaking with Fox 8 Live, he said that while a pill may look like a Percocet or some other pharmaceutical, it may actually be fentanyl. In addition to being a dangerous narcotic in the first place, more often than not, fentanyl products are manufactured illegally. They're not made under strict laws or standards like legitimate prescription pills and contain inconsistent doses of the drug. Even coming from the same batch, one fentanyl pill might kill someone while another has a much milder effect. In other words, taking these drugs is essentially like playing Russian roulette with one's life. At a time when America's opioid epidemic was plaguing rural communities, Black Mines Parish Sheriff Gerald A. Turlich Jr. vowed to go after criminals who were bringing deadly drugs into the community. Authorities eventually charged the man who sold Haley and her friend the fentanyl pill, 22-year-old Franklin Senfles, with second-degree murder. And in the end, he pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of manslaughter and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. 1. Lorenzo Elliott In the state of Louisiana, prosecutors have considerable power when it comes to the decision of whether or not to charge teens as adults for certain felonies. So, when Lorenzo Elliott was accused of being the getaway driver for two of his cousins following a robbery in New Orleans in December 2015, it didn't matter that he was a straight-A student and a member of the school band with a near-perfect attendance rate. In a Christian Science Monitor report on Elliott's run-in with the law, journalist K.T. Rechdal wrote that the ordeal started when the young man failed to show up for school one morning, prompting a social worker to call his house. And that's when Elliott's family told the worker that police had arrested him for his alleged role as the getaway driver for his cousins. He was charged as an adult, which threatened to severely damage his future and to send him to prison rather than college. Felisa Maria wrote, the social worker who called Elliot's house searching for him that morning, it wasn't unusual to learn that an absentee student had been arrested. In fact, she'd dealt with it many times. And more often than not, a student's family couldn't afford bail, landing them behind bars for months or years to come as they faced their case in court. But after seeing a number of kids with promising futures get lost to the system and never return to the classroom, Rhodes and other staff members weren't about to let it happen again. They threw their support behind Elliot full force and advocated fiercely for him in court. The morning after Elliot's arrest, Rhodes hand-delivered a letter about his accomplishments and character to the judge overseeing the case. At the time, the young man's school didn't have any resources for supporting kids who became entangled in the legal system, especially those who landed in adult court. But Rhodes vowed to devote whatever time and energy she could to helping students in these positions, starting with Elliot's case. Lorenzo Elliot would later tell the Christian Science Monitor that he grew up in public housing and found himself running with a bad crowd. He said that his own family told him he was either supposed to end up dead or in jail. 
And while Rhodes' letter failed to sway the judge, who imposed a high bail that Elliot's family couldn't afford, her advocacy gave Elliot hope that he could still have a bright future one day. Rhodes continued to fight for Elliot's release as the prosecutor weighed whether or not to pursue the case. To her, it didn't matter whether or not he was guilty. She knew that teenagers with developing minds are prone to making mistakes, and it doesn't mean they'll continue along that path as adults. Elliot might have made a terrible decision, but his academic accomplishments showed that he wanted a better life than the one he grew up with. The prosecutor decided to pursue the charges, which could have landed the young man behind bars for 15 years. But after finally reading Rhodes's letter, the judge reduced Elliot's bail, and the community came together and raised the necessary funds to secure his freedom. He immediately went back to playing in the school band and scrambled to catch up with the nearly two months' worth of lessons that he'd missed. The case dragged on until two years after Elliot's graduation, at which point he took a plea deal that spared him from prison time and came with three years of probation. His dedication to school played a major role in the judge's decision to be lenient. But Elliot gave a lot of the credit for his freedom to Rhodes, who tirelessly advocated for him to receive a second chance. And since then, Rhodes has worked with other students in need, including newly arrived immigrants who've become straight A students while fighting to legalize their residency in the US. 4. Gray Smith the mask mandates that came along with the COVID-19 pandemic caused a lot of mixed feelings in the United States, and the issue became so divisive that in some cases, police got involved. Many people felt strongly that wearing a mask helped to reduce the virus's spread, and that people had a civic duty, not to mention a legal obligation to comply with mask mandates. Others, however, believed that mask mandates violated constitutional freedoms and that they weren't effective at stopping the spread of the coronavirus in any way. These clashing views made their way into American high schools, where some students got in trouble and even made news headlines for refusing to wear a mask. Included among them was Grace Smith, a straight-A junior from Laramie, Wyoming, who stubbornly stood by her anti-mask beliefs to the point where she got arrested in the fall of 2021. Smith had no prior run-ins with the law when she refused to wear a mask, and her refusal to leave school grounds after being told to put on a mask or leave earned her multiple suspensions. She also racked up $1,000 in trespassing fines for refusing to obey the rules of the mandate. The young woman reportedly cooperated when she was first suspended, but she failed to comply with the next two. She told the Laramie Boomerang that she left as instructed after her first encounter with administrators. But after consulting a lawyer with her family, Grace took a more strong-willed stance. During the second incident, she refused to leave and accepted the $500 fine that came along with the decision. She reacted the same way the third time she was ordered to leave. But instead of quietly ticketing and fining her, the police came to the school and arrested her. As the school sat on lockdown for an hour and a half, Grace engaged in a showdown with school officials and was eventually handcuffed and hauled off to the police station. Her father, Andy, recorded the perp walk as he trailed behind the officers who were taking his daughter into custody. Other cell phone footage shows police trying to reason with Grace, but getting nowhere during the showdown that took place before her arrest. During her interview with the Laramie Boomerang, the teen emphasized the importance of protecting rights that she believed were God-given. She said that she believed people should be able to choose whether or not to wear a mask. Altogether, Grace spent 10 days suspended and faced the possibility of being expelled over her refusal to comply with the mask policy. Shortly after news broke of her arrest, Grace officially withdrew from her high school. And during a school board meeting, she accused authorities of unlawfully arresting her. She also chastised school officials for allegedly trying to own kids and make their health decisions for them. While it's unclear what Grace did next in terms of her education, she and 11 other plaintiffs who shared her anti-mask mandate views came together and filed a federal lawsuit against five school districts and the Wyoming Department of Health. The lawsuit accused state officials of committing fraud by extending Wyoming's COVID-19 public health emergency longer than necessary in order to obtain federal funding. 
And in addition to requesting a jury trial, the plaintiffs sought an injunction on mask, social distancing, COVID-19 testing, and quarantining requirements. However, the case fell apart as the plaintiffs repeatedly failed to respond to multiple motions filed on behalf of the defendants to dismiss the suit. In the meantime, three of the 11 original plaintiffs left the lawsuit, including Grace and her father. The judge ultimately dismissed the suit without prejudice, which means that the plaintiffs can file another lawsuit over the same complaints if they choose to do so in the future. 3. Mountain View High School Stabbing Located north of Provo, the city of Orem, Utah has a population that's 88% Mormon. And while it doesn't rank among America's safest communities, violence is rare in Orem, and the crime rate is below average. So, it was surprising, to say the least, when a student at Mountain View High School stabbed five of his classmates one morning in November of 2016. The young man was previously homeschooled and had started attending Mountain View three months before the incident. He was a straight-A student with no behavioral issues, and there were no indications that he was being bullied when the disturbing incident happened in a school locker room one morning before gym class. Using a knife with a three-inch blade, the teen stabbed each victim at least once, striking them in their necks and torsos before turning the weapon on himself. Staff members risked their lives to protect the school students by cornering the stabber until responding officers arrived. Police tasered the young man and took him into custody. Witnesses described a terrifying scene as students fled from the locker room covered in blood. Sophomore Paxton Ransom later told the press that he noticed blood on the locker room floor and thought it was fake until he saw one of the victims laying on the floor. The school went on lockdown for about an hour before police concluded that it was safe to resume the day. Two victims were rushed to the hospital in critical condition, while two others were listed in fair condition. The four teens were hospitalized while the fifth victim was treated and released. Thankfully, all five of the students survived their injuries. But hundreds of concerned parents showed up at the school in search of their children. Some kids returned to class while others went home for the day, unable to focus on anything after what had happened. Even now, in June of 2023, the circumstances surrounding the stabber's decision to commit the crime aren't entirely clear. According to police, the young man said he wanted to know what it felt like to kill before he inflicted similar harm on himself. Shortly after the incident, his parents wrote a heartfelt apology letter that the police released to the public. In the handwritten note, they offered their condolences to the victims and their families, and they acknowledged outright that the victims hadn't done anything to provoke their son. The parents emphasized that the act wasn't racially or ethnically motivated and said they were at a loss to explain how deeply sorry they were for what happened. After being deemed mentally competent to stand trial, the suspect pleaded guilty to five counts of attempted aggravated murder. The judge deferred to the maximum sentencing guidelines to keep him locked up for as long as possible, which in his case would be at least until the age of 21. Afterward, he'll have to serve a certain amount of community service as part of his requirement to repay the victims for his actions. 2. Student Suspended Over Inappropriate Shirt A straight-A student named Summer was finishing out her senior year at Hickory Ridge High School in North Carolina in 2017 when she unexpectedly got suspended over a dress code violation. The offensive piece of clothing was a long-sleeved, loose-fitting olive green shirt that didn't show her midsection or anything else that would typically be considered inappropriate. But it was an off-the-shoulder top which showed Summer's collarbone and the tops of her shoulders. And while it didn't seem like a big deal, it was apparently against the rules. The shirt also exposed her lower back when she sat down, which also violated school policy. The school's principal approached the teen during lunch and asked her to put a jacket to cover up her shoulders. Summer didn't see the problem with what she was wearing, so she said to the principal twice, my shirt is fine. She finally relented when a friend gave her a jacket to wear, but that wasn't the end of the ordeal. Speaking with local station WCNC, Summer said that after she put the jacket on over the shirt and zipped it up, the principal told her she had to go to another room to change. She didn't understand why the situation was continuing after she did what was asked of her to remedy the problem. 
Summer had a 4.4 GPA and was looking forward to choosing from the list of universities that would most likely be available to her, considering her top-notch grades. But this wasn't her first run-in with the school's principal over the years. In fact, so many incidents happened that Summer's mother contacted the school and told them that they had to reach out to her before taking disciplinary action against her daughter. The principal hadn't contacted the young woman's mother on the day of the shirt incident, so when she was asked to go to a separate room to change, she adamantly refused. Summer later told WCNC that she said to the principal, I'm sorry, but I can't go anywhere with you unless my mum is on the phone. When officials were unable to reach the young woman's mother, she continued with her day as usual. But while sitting in the auditorium with her friends and other students, the principal entered and sent everyone away except for Summer. Afterwards, she accused the principal of threatening to have her arrested by the school resource officer. According to Summer's version of events, the resource officer stood just feet away with his hand on his gun while the principal issued an ultimatum, go change her shirt or be arrested. While many people would likely relent at this point and follow the principal's orders, Summer felt strongly that she was being unfairly targeted for discipline. She continued trying to reach her mum, who called back right in the nick of time and advised her daughter to follow the principal's orders. After finally going to the control room and changing, she was suspended for 10 days for insubordination. More specifically, the complaint noted that Summer denied that her shirt was a problem and that she didn't do as she was told. In addition to the suspension, she was prohibited from attending her graduation and other end-of-the-year senior activities. And while the nature of Summer's history of problems with school officials was never fully disclosed, she found it wildly unfair that she worked so hard for four years to walk across the stage only to be banned from doing so. She claimed that the school was allowing drug dealers and other criminals to participate in the ceremony, yet she was excluded for wearing a supposedly offensive shirt, despite being an honor roll student. Summer's mother appealed the school's decision while the teen became increasingly worried that the suspension would affect her choice of colleges. She told WCNC that she was on track to study pre-med and that having a full ride at university was key to her future. But unfortunately, it's unclear whether Summer ended up walking across the stage at graduation and if the suspension hindered her college options. 1. Darnell Hamilton Before he became an accused criminal, high school senior Darnell Hamilton was an honor student at a Chicago prep school with a 4.0 GPA. He also had hopes of landing a scholarship at Ohio State University after graduation. But his plans for the future were interrupted in September 2013, when he was arrested for allegedly bringing a gun to school. Prosecutors initially claimed that the gun was filled with live rounds, but the school later released a statement saying that the weapon wasn't loaded. Hamilton reportedly told police that he got the gun from a friend and that he had it for protection against gangs who'd been harassing and threatening him for two years. And his mother, LaDonna Petty, told a similar story to the press. Speaking with Ballon Club Chicago, she said that her son typically encountered problems during his ride to school on public transportation. And while Hamilton School was well known for the high college acceptance rate among its students, they were still forced to deal with the reality of what goes on on the streets. According to Petty, Gangs hassle young people, which puts pressure on them to act like they're not scared in order to avoid being targeted in the future. The concerned mother had gone out of her way to protect Darnell from violence and crime, and at one point, they even packed up and moved to the smaller city of De Plan, where the crime rate is lower. But the loss of her job had forced them back to Chicago, where the problems unfortunately continued. When her son was arrested, he quickly admitted that he'd made a mistake. But she understood why, and she continued to support him through his legal troubles. School spokesperson F. Lewis acknowledged that the area surrounding the school had its challenges, but said that the school itself was well secured. He also said that Hamilton had no previous disciplinary issues. And while there's no excuse for breaking the law, Hamilton's story is a sad one, which tells the tale of a young man who didn't know what else to do in a situation where he felt like he needed to protect himself. The outcome of the case is unclear, but hopefully he managed to square away his legal troubles and continue on to college. 
Thanks for watching. What's a better excuse for doing something stupid? Being young and dumb or being drunk? Why is one more preferable than the other? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to share some first-hand examples if you have any. And don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.